Nancy. Where to start? Well, I guess I'll start at the beginning. My name is Kocho Shiona, and I've just been chosen to be the headmaster of Academy High School. To be honest, I'm not sure if I really believe this is happening. I keep pinching myself to make sure I'm not dreaming. I mean, the entire nation has been talking about this school for months. The idea of an elite high school that only opens its doors to the most intelligent students in Japan? Uh, a place for the most promising men and women of today to be transformed into the leaders of tomorrow. A school built for the sole purpose of being the most prestigious learning institute in the country. It's an ambitious undertaking, to say the least. But the thing that shocks everyone the most is that the school is being bankrolled by PsychoCorp. Who would have expected an electronics company to found a school? At first, I thought it was some kind of long-term business plan. Maybe they wanted to build a place to gather the best and brightest students of Japan and train them to be their next generation of employees. But it turns out that I was wrong. Really wrong. And I got to hear the truth straight from Mr. Psycho himself. That's right. I just met the Psycho Psycho in person. I'm still shaking. It was like getting to meet Leonardo da Vinci or, or Thomas Edison. I've lost count of how many things he's invented or improved. I, I don't think there's a single product in my home that doesn't have the Psycho logo on it. A man whose ideas and inventions change the world. People like that are only born once a century. Anyway, the reason he built this school, it blew my mind. It's not something he's ever mentioned in public, but he didn't tell me to keep it a secret either. So, here it is. It's his daughter. It's all for his daughter. He cherishes her more than life itself, even more than his multi-billion dollar corporate empire. He wants to make her dreams come true. So he's building a high school customized to suit her exact tastes. The name of the school, the location, where it's being constructed, even the exact layout of the building. Everything was chosen by his daughter. His mission is to make sure that the best years of her life happen at Academy High. She gets to decide who's allowed to enroll, she gets to decide the school's policies, and I'm pretty sure she gets to be the student council president starting from day one. No questions asked. So, not only will this school be a collection of Japan's most highly qualified teachers and most brilliant students, but it's also a giant, shining monument to a father's love for his daughter. <laughs> it almost brings a tear to my eye. And I'm going to be the headmaster. I'm still surprised I actually had the courage to send in my application. I, I guess it's because the qualifications they were looking for seemed surprisingly low compared to the qualifications for every other position at the school. In fact, Mr. Psycho told me I was perfect for the job after just asking me a few questions. There's a part of me that wonders if his daughter just wants the school's headmaster to have a certain appearance or a certain name or voice or something. I'm not really sure if I got the job because I qualify for it or because I meet some invisible criteria that I'm not aware of. I guess Mr. Psycho could tell I was nervous because he gave me a gift. This portable tape recorder. One of his inventions. He told me that it's therapeutic to record an audio journal when you're feeling overwhelmed. That's the whole reason I'm recording this right now. And I gotta say, it actually worked. I feel much better now. You know, this is kind of fun. It might turn into a habit. <laughs> I can't stop thinking about the last thing he said before he left. He called me Headmaster Shuyona. <laughs> Be a while before I get used to hearing that. realize how much dust was on this thing. Well, I suppose I should consider myself lucky. If I never use this thing, it means everything has been going so smoothly that I just never feel the need to vent. But something happened today that really threw me off. I wouldn't feel right talking about it with any of my colleagues, but I need to get it off my chest. So maybe recording my thoughts will help. 
Today, I visited Psycho headquarters for a routine meeting with Mr. Psycho, just as I've done dozens of times over the past few years. But today was different. He was angry, foul-mouthed, and short-tempered. I'd never seen him like that before. He didn't reprimand me for anything, and we simply discussed the usual topics, but the entire time he seemed like he was on the verge of exploding. I was confused and worried, and frankly, scared. His secretary must have seen how shaken I was, because after the meeting, she took a moment to assure me that I hadn't done anything wrong, and that Mr. Psycho was angry about a personal matter. On most days, I would never dream of gossiping about the man who signs my paychecks, but my curiosity got the better of me, and I asked her for details. She didn't know all the specifics, but she knew enough to give me a basic summary. Earlier that day, Mr. Psycho had a furious argument with his daughter, who graduated recently. Apparently, she doesn't want to inherit the company, and she's decided to leave Japan to travel the world. This is absolutely unacceptable to her father, because he's invested a lot of resources into giving her the training necessary to take over his empire when he retires. He had absolute faith that his daughter would inherit his company when the time came, and her decision had invalidated all of his plans, along with many years of effort, not to mention an incalculable amount of money. After a long, heated discussion, well, more like a shouting contest from the sound of it, Mr. Psycho threatened to disown his daughter, and she had absolutely no problem with that. He told her, If you walk out that door, you're no longer a part of this family. And moments later, she left his office without a word. Mr. Psycho is a man who refuses to compromise and only accepts the results he wants. I'm 100% certain that from this day forward, his daughter is dead to him. The secretary told me a little more about the way Mr. Psycho raised his daughter. Starting from early childhood, she was given training to prepare her for the responsibilities that come with operating a company, training that became more advanced and intense with each passing year. Mr. Psycho also has a son, but he didn't put his son through the same sort of training as his daughter. Instead, he granted his son a perfectly normal childhood, perhaps out of guilt for what he did to his daughter. But now he's making preparations to rapidly change the direction of his son's life, so the boy will acquire the traits and skills that his sister spent her entire life developing. The strangest part is the exact reason why Mr. Psycho's daughter wants to travel the world. One phrase the secretary kept hearing was, My sister... Apparently, Mr. Psycho's daughter is absolutely convinced that she has a sister somewhere in the world, and that she needs to find her. But Mr. Psycho only has two children, so if she says she has a sister, there are three options. She's speaking figuratively, she's actually become delusional, or Mr. Psycho has an illegitimate child. At this point, the secretary decided she'd said too much and stopped talking. I had a feeling I was starting to tread on dangerous ground, so I chose not to pry any further. Even though I wound up with more questions than answers, at least now I know why he was so angry. Losing his daughter, along with more than a decade of money, planning, effort, must be an incredibly painful experience. But after hearing all this, it'll be hard for me to look at him the same way I used to. He told me that he built Academy High to give his daughter the perfect, ideal high school life. But now I think that was just a cover story. I think he built Academy High and made his daughter the student council president to put her through the experience of being in charge of an organization. The, the school wasn't a gift from a father to a daughter. It was just another component of her lifelong training, another, another step in the process of turning her into the perfect CEO. Uh... A training simulation. And now he's going to put his son through an accelerated version of that process. <sighs> Poor boy. It doesn't surprise me at all that she defied her father and ran away from all that. But in the end, it wasn't pressure or stress that made her reject her father's wishes. It was this weird notion that she has a sister. 
Maybe all the stress drove her crazy. The weirdest thing of all is that when I imagine Mr. Psycho with another daughter, I have a mental image of what she would look like. But I get a headache if I picture her in my mind for too long. Man, really creeps me out. If Academy High was built solely for one girl, and that girl has graduated, what happens next? I was afraid the school was going to be shut down, but apparently Mr. Psycho just wants me to continue business as usual. A lot of the students who graduate from this school get offers from Psycho Corp almost immediately after graduation, so I guess this place really did turn out to be a training ground for future Psycho employees after all. I don't feel angry or sad. Just disenchanted. Well, it's an easy job, and I can't argue with the pay, so I guess I'll just stay on my current course for now. Man, even though I know that nobody is going to listen to this tape, I feel way better after recording my thoughts. <laughs> I guess Mr. Psycho's gift was good for something after all. Thanks for hearing me out, Mr. Tape Recorder. <laughs> With that said, I hope I don't have to use you again anytime soon. <laughs> wow. Can everything really collapse this easily? Cameras, interviews, police. I don't want this to be my life. The past few years were perfect. Why did this have to happen? It's... it's not like it was my fault. Or... was it? I... I guess I understand why they're putting all the blame on me. It's... it's my school. I'm responsible for it, and everyone inside of it, but... How was I supposed to... How could I have seen this coming? What could I have possibly done to have prevented this? A murderer. A killer in my school. Those girls who disappeared. I don't want to admit it, but it fits. Those missing girls are probably dead. Dead. I... Was there anything I could have done? Could I have stopped this? Could I have saved them? If I was more vigilant, more strict with background checks. I mean, what am I supposed to do? Have metal detectors and security cameras in every hallway? Do a mental health check on every student every hour? How do you prepare for this? You can't. It's... it's... If, if someone is just crazy, just insane, then you... You're screwed. It's it's not your fault or, or anything. It just... It happens because they're just... They're just this, this crazy, screwed-up person. It's not... It's not your fault if this happens. It's not your fault. It's not... It's not my fault. On April 1st, Ryoba Aishi put a note into the locker of Sumire Saitozaki. After reading this note, Sumire went to the East Third Floor Girls' Restroom. That was the last time anyone ever saw Sumire. After she was reported missing, police investigated Akademi for clues. In the East Third Floor Girls' Restroom, they found some of Sumire's blood. Shortly before Sumire went missing, Ryoba Aishi was spotted carrying a knife and walking in the direction of the East Third Floor Girls' Restroom. Later, she was seen carrying a large garbage bag towards the school incinerator. All of this information came from Ui Tunisu, a student at Akademi, who was interviewed by the police the day after Sumire's disappearance. It's obvious what happened to Sumire. Ryoba Aishi killed her in the bathroom with a knife, stuffed her in a garbage bag, and carried her to the incinerator where she burned all of the evidence. Do you deny any of this? 
Ryoba Aishi. I did not kill Sumire Saitozaki. It's true that I put a note in her locker and spoke with her in the bathroom. But I simply wanted to discuss a personal matter with her. Nothing more. What about the knife? I noticed that one of the knives in the home economics room was missing. It turned out that someone had brought the knife to the cooking club by mistake. So, I simply took it from the cooking club and put it back in its rightful place. And the garbage bag? How do you explain that? I love my school. I can't stand to see trash and garbage piling up everywhere. I do my part to keep the school clean, just like everyone else does. <laughs> you always have a convenient explanation for everything, don't you? Do you really think anyone in this courtroom is going to believe your obvious lies? <sighs> Mr. Journalist, there are a number of problems with your theory. First of all, you're accusing me of murder, but you don't actually have any proof that Sumire is dead. She is still considered missing, after all. I think she simply ran away because of the stress of studying at an elite school. I pray that she is alive and well, and will return to us one day. You think I killed Sumire because of three facts. I spoke to her, I held a knife, and I burned some trash. However, none of these things are grounds for suspicion. Every day at school, dozens of students talk to each other, touch objects that could be used as weapons, and carry garbage bags to the incinerator. There was nothing unusual or suspicious about my behavior. You know, I think I finally figured out what's going on here, Mr. Journalist. Your apprentice, Sonoko Sakanoe, became a celebrity after she stopped a killer. You're desperate to pin a crime on me, because you want to be a celebrity too. The only reason that any of us are in this courtroom today is because you're deeply insecure that your apprentice has accomplished more than you. Order! Order in the court! <laughs> it's true that there is no smoking gun evidence linking you directly to a murder. However, with that said, over the past 11 weeks, you have demonstrated behavior that is suspicious, if not outright incriminating. Your classmates have testified that you've been stalking a certain boy at school, following him when he goes shopping, following him when he walks home. By all accounts, you're absolutely obsessed with this boy. Furthermore, every time a girl begins to show signs of interest in him, Something always happens that removes the girl from his life. You can't possibly expect anyone to believe that these facts are mere coincidence. Clearly, you are sabotaging the boy's love life in order to keep him single. And who else had a crush on that boy? That's right. Sumire Saitozaki. You've been eliminating every girl who comes between you and that boy. And Sumire was your first victim. Order! I said order! Enough conjecture. Let's go over the facts.
Taking all of the facts into consideration, it is clear beyond any shadow of a doubt that Ryoba Aishi is innocent of all charges. A murderous schoolgirl who kills in the name of love. It was a novel concept. Newspapers realized it would get sales. TV stations realized it would boost ratings. It didn't take long for the news of my murder trial to spread across the entire nation. I've never seen an event get that much coverage before. It was a real media circus. And now... Everyone in the country knows my name and face. Even worse, they all know how I feel about my senpai. Oh, this is my worst nightmare. I didn't want him to learn about me like this. I wanted our first meeting to be special. Perfect. Exactly like in my dreams. But now, that can never happen. He'll never be able to see me as a cute underclassman who has a crush on him. He'll only be able to see me as that girl who was accused of murder on national TV. If I confess my love to him now, I doubt he'll want anything to do with me. Even though I was declared innocent, there will always be doubts in his mind. That stupid journalist ruined absolutely everything. There's nothing I want more than to rip his heart out and shove it down his throat. But spilling any blood right now would only attract more attention. There are too many eyes on me right now. I have to lay low for a while. Revenge isn't an option at this point in time. But I'll never forget what that man did. I won't be able to have a romantic confession underneath a cherry tree. But this isn't over yet. I still have one option remaining. My last resort. It's unfortunate that things turned out like this. But I was left with no other choice. I would have been crushed if he rejected me. So, I had to take away the option. Our relationship might be awkward for a little while, but we'll get through it together. After all, I know all of his likes and dislikes. <laughs> I'm sure he'll warm up to me soon. Ah, <sighs> There's a part of me that wonders, what was the point of all the hard work I just did if I was just going to kidnap him in the end? But, despite the way things turned out... I don't think the past 11 weeks were a waste at all. I learned so many new things and gained so many new skills. I'm sure I'll be able to find a way to put all of my knowledge and talents to good use. And one day, I can pass down everything I know to my son or daughter. <laughs> There's still so much to look forward to. Oh, darling! You're finally awake! Uh, what? Watching you sleep is always fun, but it gets a bit old after six hours, you know? What's happening? Where am I? We're in my basement, darling! My mom went through a lot of trouble to get this basement added to our home. What are you talking about? Huh? What is this? Am I tied to a chair? That's right, darling. That's the very same chair that my mother built for my father while she was keeping him here. And now you get to sit there, too. Isn't that romantic? Aren't you... that girl's been on the TV lately? What was it? aishi -san? Oh, you don't need to be so formal, darling. You can use my first name, you know. Oh, God. It's not true, is it? All those things the journalist said? I said, use my first name, darling. I'm sorry. I 
don't know you well enough to say my name. Riopa, Riopa. Uh. <sighs> what? Oh, darling, I've been waiting so long to hear you say that. I'm so glad that I caught it on tape. What do you want from me? Am I your next victim? Victim? Of course not, darling. You're the one I was protecting this whole time. Protecting? You mean all those girls at school? That's right, darling. They were threatening our love. I had to get rid of them all. Love? But we've never even spoken to each other before. I know, darling. It's so exciting to talk to you for the first time. I can't wait to have all of our firsts. Our first date, our first meal together, our first kiss, our first... <laughs> Ryoba-chan, if you love someone, you shouldn't kidnap them and tie them to a chair. Well, how else am I supposed to make sure that you don't try to run away, darling? Please, please, let me go. I promise I won't tell the police. Sorry, darling. You're not allowed out of that chair until I'm 100% sure that you'll never try to leave me. From this day forward, I'm never going to let you out of my sight. We'll be together forever. For forever? That's right. Oh, looks like it's time to change the tape. One moment, darling. <laughs> What a goddamn disgrace! Innocent? Innocent! Innocent my ass! She's the culprit! She did it! That girl, that monster! I've never seen someone so goddamn manipulative! She fooled them all! Every single one of them was dancing in the palm of her hand by the end! What a... what a farce! People are dead. Young people who had promising futures whose lives I was responsible for. She did it. She did it. She's the only one who could have. That blood is on her hands. And now, now she walks free. That conniving little... And I'm expected to... To let her back in the school. Stand on a stage and hand her a diploma? Mr. Psycho told me to let it go, but I, I, I can't. I can't let this go. She murdered people and got away with it. I can't believe... God damn, this is just... This was supposed to bring closure. This was supposed to close the chapter. This was... God damn her! God damn her. I didn't realize how pathetic this was until I hit the record button. Ugh, there are distressing things I want to talk about. But the only people around me are my colleagues at work. I can't show weakness in front of my subordinates, so if I want to talk and have someone listen, then I have to use this. A tape recorder. God. The problem is enrollment is dropping. The past few years weren't too bad, but now... For the first time since the school opened, enrollment is actually lower than the previous year. This was... This was the only good thing I had going for me, and now I'm watching it die. I can pinpoint the exact moment when the decline began. That trial damn trial. As soon as, as the media started calling this place the murder school, our fate was sealed. The only suspect was found innocent. So the public believes that the culprit is still at large. 
Nobody wants to attend a school where a serial killer might be running loose. But that... that was six years ago. Six years. We haven't had any incidents since then. It's safe here. What am I supposed to do? Hang a sign on the front door of the school that says, We've gone six years without a murder. You can all come back now. Ugh. We had momentum. We had an upwards trajectory. We were rising, soaring. We were on the road to being as internationally renowned as Harvard or Yale. But that trial, it, it killed the momentum. And once you lose momentum, it's almost impossible to get it back. Sometimes I wish... Sometimes I wish that journalist had never said anything. If he'd kept his mouth shut, just... Just let her get away with everything. There never would have been a media circus. Just some... Mysterious disappearances that would have been forgotten in a few months, but... No, he had to drag us all into a big scandal. If only some... Some random person would just be found guilty for all those murders, then... Maybe... Maybe this notion of a serial killer running loose around Academy would finally go away. Ugh, God damn it. What am I saying? I don't really mean any of that. It's just... It's this... This whole situation is just... It, it has me... It, ugh. I'm wrong, though. It's not the journalist's fault. It's not the court's fault. It's not even my fault. This is her fault. It's all her fault. I saw her! That, that woman, I saw her again! The one who's responsible for everything! I... I... Perhaps I'll start at the beginning. Every week, I travel to Psycho Corporate Headquarters to have a meeting with Mr. Psycho about Academy. This time, I arrived a few minutes earlier than expected. I asked the secretary if it would be all right to begin the meeting early, but she refused. She told me that Mr. Psycho had another appointment right before mine, and that I'd have to wait my turn before I could see him. I took a seat and began to wait. That's when she walked into the room. It's been ten years, but not a single day has gone by that I haven't thought about her. The one who ruined everything for me. I recognized her immediately. She had aged, but I could still tell it was her. She glanced in my direction for a moment, and our eyes met. She smirked, but said nothing to me. She walked straight through the waiting room and directly into Mr. Psycho's office, without even speaking a single word to the secretary. At first, I was speechless. Then I jumped out of my seat and asked the secretary to identify that woman. The secretary was silent for a few moments, and then gave me some generic platitude about how the details of Mr. Psycho's appointments must be kept strictly confidential. That didn't stop me from asking everything that came to mind. How long had that woman been coming here? How often? What business did she have here? But the secretary was like a stone wall that refused to budge. I couldn't just leave it at that. I left the waiting room and asked the nearest employees if they could help me. When they saw how distraught I was, they were eager to help, but... When I asked them if they had seen that woman who just walked by, they... Their attitudes changed in a heartbeat. They slowly turned away from me and returned to their work in silence. They ignored me, as if I wasn't even there. I haven't been treated like that since I was a schoolboy. I returned to the waiting room and paced back and forth anxiously, waiting for that woman to exit Mr. Psycho's office. 
I'd spent years fantasizing about an encounter like this one. I, I had rehearsed every single word I would say to her if I had an opportunity to speak with her again. I was fully prepared to tell her exactly how I felt about her actions ten years ago. Then I heard the secretary's voice. Mr. Psycho will see you now. I was baffled. That woman was still in the office, wasn't she? Why would the secretary send me in there? I was confused, but eager to see that woman again. I approached the door to Mr. Psycho's office. I remember that my hand was actually trembling as I gripped the handle. I took a deep breath and opened the door to his office, expecting to see her standing there, but... But she wasn't. The only people in that room were Mr. Psycho and his son. I entered the office and looked around in confusion, wondering where that woman could have been hiding, but, but she was nowhere to be seen. Mr. Psycho asked me what was troubling me, and I, I told him exactly what was on my mind. That woman, the one who walked into your office a few minutes ago, where is she? When did she leave? But Mr. Psycho didn't reply. He only smirked, as if he was uh, amused by the situation asked me to take a seat. He tried to talk about Academy, like usual, but I wasn't having any of it. I didn't want to let go of the subject, and I, I kept asking about that woman. Mr. Psycho's amusement quickly turned to irritation, and he firmly asked me to keep our conversation to the matter of Academy. Mr. Psycho can be quite imposing, even while remaining civil, and from that moment onward, I was too scared to pursue the matter further. I dropped it, and we proceeded to have a standard meeting. As ever, Mr. Psycho's son stood behind his father in silence. Mr. Psycho had never told me the exact reason why he keeps his son at his side during business meetings. It's uh, most likely that it's a form of training, exposing him to the type of interactions he'll be having on a daily basis once he inherits his father's empire. As the years passed, I have watched Mr. Psycho's son grow from a young boy into a young man. But I can count on one hand the number of times I've heard him speak. The meeting adjourned. I made one last attempt to bring up the subject of that woman, but Mr. Psycho interrupted me and bid me farewell. I knew that I wouldn't be able to get anything out of him, so I simply left. I questioned the secretary again, but nothing. I got nothing. I attempted to talk to the nearest employees, but they politely excused themselves. It was as if that woman was a taboo subject that no one was allowed to speak of, or that she was a mere hallucination, something I, something I dreamt up. No, no, I didn't just imagine her. I saw her. I saw her. I didn't catch her out of the corner of my eye. I didn't glimpse her for only a moment. We looked directly at each other, but... But what business would that woman have with Mr. Psycho? What could he possibly want from her? Why didn't the secretary acknowledge her when she walked in? And, and how, how did she leave his office? There was only one way to leave that room, and I was standing right in front of it. It, it doesn't make any sense. It, it... <sighs> I won't give up here. I'm going to dig for answers until I'm forced to stop. I don't know how much I'll be able to learn, but... But it can't end here. It... it can't. Fifteen years. That's how much time has passed. Fifteen years. Fifteen years watching it all spiral downward. Never managed to pull out of that nosedive. Fifteen years without closure. Without justice. What would my life been like if I'd never taken this job? Probably have a wife by now. Children. But there's no room for anything like that. Not with Academy taking up so much of my time. 
Even if I did have a family, I wouldn't be a part of their lives. I'd be too busy with Akademi. I'd make a terrible husband. A terrible father. I sacrificed the best years of my life for this school. And what did I get in return? Wrinkles and hair loss from all the stress. A big, fat gut. I don't even recognize the man in the mirror anymore. Sure, I've made money. But what use is money when I never have time to spend it? I don't even know what I'd use it for. I never have enough spare time to develop a hobby. Well, I suppose I do have one hobby. I asked myself, what good is being the headmaster of a school? What opportunities do I have that nobody else has? Only one thing came to mind. Something taboo. But once the idea's in my head, it was impossible to just stop thinking about it. Eventually, I just couldn't find a reason to resist the temptation. It's not like I have anything left to lose. It's not like my life could get any worse than it already is, so... I gave it a try. And you know what? I don't even feel guilty about it. You see, filming someone does absolutely no harm to them. No harm whatsoever. It's not as though I post the videos online or anything like that. It has zero impact on their lives, so what's wrong with putting a few cameras around? At this point, I don't even care if I get caught. Actually, the risk of getting caught makes it a little more thrilling. And even if I did get in trouble, at least it would shake things up a bit. My life would finally change in some way. And for that reason alone, I would be happy. It's a win-win. I just wish I'd thought of this sooner. Whenever I sit in front of Mr. Psycho and give him an update about Academy, I expect him to be furious with me. The school's reputation and enrollment have both been declining for almost three decades, despite my efforts to turn them around. Mr. Psycho has every right to chew my head off, but he doesn't. As a matter of fact, he seems quite indifferent towards Academy as a whole. Our weekly meetings feel like a formality and nothing more. Something we do merely because it became routine. I get the impression that he couldn't possibly care any less about Academy and keeps it operational purely because closing the school would reflect poorly on Psycho Corp. Or perhaps because the school had become something of a monument to his missing daughter. Perhaps he's more sentimental than he looks. If Academy's enrollment numbers continue to drop at their current rate, less than 100 students will be attending the school next year. At this point, it's clear that nothing I've tried over the past 30 years is going to save the school's reputation. So, with practically nothing left to lose, I propose something radical to Mr. Psycho. A complete rebranding. My research has shown me that Academy's declining popularity is directly connected to the school's reputation for notoriously difficult entrance exams and needlessly strict rules. The last thing I'd want is to allow the school to fill up with imbeciles and degenerates. But it has become obvious that the school's reputation will never recover unless sweeping reforms are made. I presented Mr. Psycho with a list of everything that would make the school a more welcoming environment. Allowing students to style their hair, wear makeup and accessories, customize their uniforms, bring smartphones to school, enter romantic relationships, 
access the rooftop and so forth. I even proposed making the entrance exams a little less difficult and lowering the tuition fees. I truly didn't know how Mr. Psycho would react. On one hand, he seemed apathetic about Academy. On the other hand, I was proposing a complete reversal of everything that Academy stood for. After I concluded my presentation, he sat in silence for a while. I wasn't sure if he was giving my proposal deep consideration, or simply pondering whether or not he cared at all. Eventually, he shrugged his shoulders and simply said, Give it a try. I'm not sure whether or not the rebranding is going to be a success, but for the first time in years, I feel excited. Like I actually have something to look forward to. The tedium of the last few decades had become unbearable. And these big, drastic changes are exactly what I needed to break up the monotony. I'm eager to see what kind of crowd these reforms will bring in. Here's to a new chapter in the story of Academy. Huh. Well, that was the weirdest day of my life. In the past 30 years, I've had over a thousand meetings with Mr. Psycho. When I walked into his office today for our weekly meeting, I could immediately tell that something was very wrong. Everything about him, posture, expression, demeanor, was completely different. He was slouching low in his chair, staring blankly at a wall. Didn't even bother to greet me as I walked in. More importantly, his son, who had been present for every one of our meetings over the past three decades, was not there. I asked, will your son be joining us today, to which he simply replied, there is no reason for that anymore. As I took my seat, I asked him if anything was wrong. He didn't reply. The heavy atmosphere of the room made me feel uncomfortable with the idea of attempting to advance the conversation, so I chose to remain silent until he was ready to talk. As it turned out, I would be waiting for quite some time. The silence lasted for about 15 incredibly tense and uncomfortable minutes. When Mr. Psycho finally did speak, he suddenly started rambling about Okinawa. He spoke of his experience as a soldier during World War II, how he volunteered to fight at the age of 17, how a bomb hit his dormitory, how he spent hours buried underneath rubble, staring at the corpses of his dead friends. He said he still sees them on the back of his eyelids every time he closes his eyes. He told me that buried underneath that rubble over 70 years ago, he swore an oath to punish the world for killing his friends. He swore to revive Japanese nationalism and expand the Japanese empire until it covered the entire globe. That's why he started his company. That's why he spent his life building the greatest conglomerate the world has ever known. That's why he toiled for over half a century until he had become the richest man on earth. It was all for the sake of building up enough power and influence to instigate a war. A war that he would throw all of his money and resources into until he had achieved the complete annihilation of every country that fought against Japan in World War II. But something happened that he didn't expect. Globalization spread Japanese culture across the face of the planet. Japan's former enemies now enjoy friendly relations with Japan. They eat Japanese food, watch Japanese animations, play Japanese video games, the process was sped up by his own inventions and innovations. There's a psycho product in every home. 
He can't find the motivation to go to war anymore, knowing that he'd be blowing up his own loyal customers. He dedicated his entire life to setting the stage for a blood-soaked military victory. But in the process, he inadvertently achieved a slow, pacifistic cultural victory. By now, almost everyone who pulled a trigger or launched a bomb during World War II was dead or elderly. So revenge had lost all meaning. Instead of feeling pride for accomplishing more than any other man in history, he just felt like he had failed his dead friends. After his long, rambling speech came to an end, he returned to staring blankly at the wall. I'm not sure why he confided all that information in me. I don't think it's because he considered me a friend. It's more likely that he thought of me... Well, the same way I think of this tape recorder. Just a stupid object where you can store your thoughts without consequence. After some more silence, he eventually spoke up again. He said, My health is failing. I will likely die soon. I will make no attempt to prolong my life. I am retiring as CEO starting tomorrow. My son will be taking over for me. You will be meeting with him from now on. He said nothing else. But I could tell that the meeting was over. That was most likely the last time I'll ever speak with him. Or see him in person. The next time I address someone as Mr. Psycho, I'll be talking to his son. The world's most famous man. Secretly a nationalist with plans for world domination. Harboring a half-century-long grudge. Huh. I would tell the media, but... It wouldn't matter one bit. Psycho Corp controls everything that the media says or does. Even if I told the world what he confided in me, the media would never run the story. And it would quickly be dismissed as a baseless rumor or crackpot conspiracy theory. <laughs> I guess, in that sense, he really did take over the world. Looks like it still works. As long as it's recording, I suppose I might as well say something. How long has it been since I last used this thing? It's been at least two decades. Almost three. Those were better times. I was so young back then. My future seemed so bright. I remember following my dreams. I remember a promising career. I remember being happy. If I could turn back time, what would I do differently? I know. I know exactly what I should have done. I shouldn't have gotten involved with that case. With that girl. Pursuing her was the right thing to do. But if I hadn't involved myself with her, I'd still have a career. When did it begin? I think it was... April of 1989. The peak of my career as an investigative journalist. That's when I heard about a murder at the local high school. The police had no leads. I decided to investigate it myself. I tried to be a hero. And that was the worst mistake of my life. The school's faculty didn't let me conduct an investigation on school grounds. They were highly concerned with maintaining their prestigious reputation. They didn't want any police or journalists snooping around and ruining the school's image any more than the murder already had. Or maybe they just had something to hide and didn't want the authorities to find out. To this day, I still don't know how the school managed to convince the police that any crime that takes place on school grounds can only be investigated for six hours maximum. I heard a rumor 
point that the school's headmaster bribes the police department to <laughs> expedite their investigations as much as possible. There were a lot of unsavory rumors about the school's headmaster, but none have been proven to be true. Because I couldn't work around the school, I used to gather information by interviewing students outside of the school gate when they entered or left the school. It was at this point in time that I noticed a peculiar girl who was quite obviously stalking one of her seniors. I decided to keep my eye on her, and before long, I began to observe some disturbing behavior from her. From the school gate, I witnessed the girl do more than just stalk an upperclassman. She stalked any girl who spoke to him. Through student interviews, I kept tabs on what happened to those girls. They became the victims of bullying, were expelled, and in some cases, stopped coming to school. I frequently saw the girl running with a mop and a bucket, as though she always had some sort of mess to clean up. That girl was using manipulation, intimidation, and sometimes even violence to sabotage the boy's love life. If she wasn't above that kind of behavior, the possibility of murder didn't seem too far off. I didn't want to believe that a schoolgirl would actually commit murder just to keep a boy single, but the evidence was staring me straight in the face. That's when I learned a crucial piece of information. The girl who was murdered at the beginning of the school year had a crush on the same boy that was being stalked. The final piece of the puzzle had fallen into place. I knew that I had found the culprit. I went to the police with my findings. Took a lot of talking, but I was eventually able to convince them to take the girl into custody. The idea of a murderous schoolgirl was scandalous enough to attract lots of attention. Word of her arrest quickly spread across the entire nation. The trial turned into a media circus. I became a celebrity practically overnight. I didn't want to be a public figure, but I did want my investigative skill to be recognized. I hoped that all the attention would boost my career. As it turns out, I was dead wrong. That manipulative little schoolgirl put on the best act I've ever seen. She cried nonstop, feigned ignorance at every opportunity, and had an excuse for every accusation leveled at her. The court fell in love with her. The media fell in love with her. The entire damn nation fell in love with her. She called me a dirty pervert who enjoyed leering at schoolgirls. She called me a fame-seeking yellow journalist. She claimed that I only accused her of murder for sensational headlines. The court bought every word of it. The day the judge declared her innocent, the entire country celebrated like it was a damn holiday. From that day forward, I was a national disgrace. I was known across the country as a lecherous journalist who stalked schoolgirls and tried to throw a girl in prison to boost his own career. I saw disgust in the eyes of every person who looked at me. My house and my car were vandalized every day for weeks. Needless to say, I was never able to work as a journalist again. The police department that arrested the girl was also the subject of national criticism. They were accused of being incompetent fools who would arrest anyone without sufficient evidence. Ever since then, the police in that town have been extremely lenient in an attempt to repair their reputation, and don't want to go anywhere near the local high school except for extremely brief periods of time. But the worst part of the entire experience didn't come from the media or the public. Immediately after the trial, I tried to escape the press by hiding in an alley behind the courthouse. Only one person found me there. It wasn't a journalist or a reporter. It was the girl that had just been declared innocent. I'll never forget her face that day. She was smiling, but her eyes were blank, empty, soulless, like a doll's eyes. She looked like she didn't have a single ounce of humanity in her entire body. With that smiling face, she said to me, it would be very easy to make your death look like a suicide. Don't ever cross me again. She turned around and left without another word. My life was a living hell for about a year, while the trial was still fresh in people's minds. Eventually, the hatred subsided, but it never truly died. 
There was always someone who recognized me, no matter how much I tried to change my appearance. Finding employment was nearly impossible. I drifted between part-time jobs and spent my free time drinking to ease the pain of becoming the national punching bag. It was around this point in time that I met my future wife. I still don't understand what she saw in me. I was an absolute wreck, not to mention the laughingstock of the entire country. But as soon as we met, she wanted to spend every waking moment with me. She wouldn't let me out of her sight and got possessive if another woman so much as looked at me. I quickly came to depend on her for everything. It wasn't long before I couldn't live without her. I certainly wasn't in any state to take care of myself. I was like an adult-sized baby, helpless and vulnerable. Who knows? Maybe that's what she was attracted to. Maybe she just wanted to experience the sensation of owning a person. Maybe she wanted to keep a human pet. Maybe all she wanted was someone who she could emotionally depend on. Even after all these years, I don't understand why anyone would waste their time with a man like me. But none of that mattered. Despite all my flaws, she accepted me. And that's all I needed. We got married about six months after meeting each other. My wife died while giving birth to our only child. I still don't know how I possibly found the strength to keep going after I lost her. I was completely dependent on her for absolutely everything. I could barely take care of myself, much less a baby. Somehow, I managed to make it through those years. But even after all this time, I'm still a deadbeat drunk who can't hold down a job. It was very difficult to love my own infant daughter, knowing that my wife was dead because of her. I'm pretty sure I was a horrible father. She practically had to raise herself. I never tried to spend much time with her or learn about her interests. Even now, I don't think I know very much about her. I don't even know what kind of person she's turned into. I don't even know what her everyday life is like. I know that she spends all of her time on her computer. She bought it herself. She seems to have a lot of money for someone her age. I'm afraid to ask where it comes from. Sometimes she comes home with blood on her clothing. I can't tell if it's her blood or someone else's blood. I try to stay out of her business. It's partially out of respect for her privacy. But it's mostly out of fear. I've never told anyone about any of this. Never saw a shrink, never had any friends to confide in. I thought that it would be therapeutic to record my feelings, even if I'm only talking to an obsolete machine. But this hasn't calmed me down at all. The only thing to come out of this experience is that all of the anger and hate I've kept buried for the past two decades has risen back to the surface. I don't think I can go back to the way things were before. I don't think I can go back to wasting my time with crappy part-time jobs, drinking, and sitting on a couch feeling miserable. I don't want this to be my life. But I can't let myself die just yet, either. Not until I see justice served. That girl from 1989... She's grown woman by now, but she's never been punished for the sins of her youth. I can't go on living in a world where a monster like her walks around in public. I'm the only one who knows the truth about her, so I'm the only one who can bring her to justice. I still know how to track a person down. I still know how to learn a person's secrets. I still know how to dig up the truth. For the first time in decades... I feel like I have a purpose. I feel like I know what to do with my life. I'm going to deliver justice to that murderer. I'm going to die trying. <laughs> this old antique was good for something after all. I found her. It wasn't hard. 
She never even moved out of her hometown. I've been following her around town for the past week. It's not that hard to follow someone without being spotted if you know the right tricks. The only difficult part is looking at her without being consumed with disgust. Thinking about what she got away with. Thinking about what she's responsible for. It almost makes me go blind with rage. This whole week, I felt like something was wrong. Yesterday, I realized what it was. I'm surprised it took me so long to figure it out. She suddenly changed directions while walking, or linger in one place for seemingly no reason. I recognize that behavior. It's my own behavior. I know what she's doing. She's stalking someone. It didn't take me long to figure out who her prey was. A young woman just out of high school. I don't know what she's done wrong, but she's clearly marked for death. She'll be dead within a week if I don't do something. I want to warn her that a killer is stalking her, but... I can't repeat the mistakes of the past. In order to convict this monster and send her to prison, I need firm evidence that she's a murderer. If I save this young woman's life, I won't have any evidence. I have to let her die. And I have to be there when it happens, filming her murder. It's the only way to get the evidence I need. The only way to make sure that justice is served. But, is this really justice? Letting a woman die? If I don't get this monster arrested, then there will only be more victims in the future. So, letting her commit murder one last time is the right thing to do. Isn't it? I'm a fool. I'm a goddamned fool. I got sloppy. She caught me. I followed her into an alley, lost her in the shadows. Then I heard her voice from behind me. Long time no see, Mr. Journalist. I turned around and saw her just inches away from me. She was smiling. I recognized that smile. It was the exact same smile she wore when she threatened my life in 1989. I didn't know what to do. I just turned and ran. I've broken a truce that lasted almost three decades. She knows I was after her. There's no way she'll let me live. I'm doomed. I can't go to the police. I'll sound like a babbling lunatic without evidence, and right now I don't have any. Even if they do listen to me and investigate her, they won't find anything. My only option is to leave town. No. Oh, no, it's worse than that. I have to leave Japan altogether. <laughs> I searched for you, but I couldn't find you. I can't wait for you to come home. I have to leave immediately. I'm going to gather all the recordings I've made so far and put them where I know you'll find them. That way, at least you'll know why your father disappeared so suddenly. I only hope that she doesn't try to get revenge on me by harming you. <laughs> I don't know when I'll be back. I don't know if I'll be back. I don't know if she's willing to cross oceans to hunt her prey. If she is, I'll try to lure her into a trap, try to expose her true nature in front of the police. It's my only hope. I know you can take care of yourself. If I had more time, there's so many things I'd say to you, but I can't. Not now. <laughs> Stay safe. standing behind you? I thought you would have been able to tell by now, darling. Well, you do make a career at not being seen. What were you doing down here, darling? Oh, are those our old tapes? The ones we made back in the 80s? <laughs> Did you get a bit nostalgic for the good old days? Well, I suppose you could say that. You know, I had a nostalgic moment today, too, darling. I saw someone who I hadn't seen in decades. And by that, I mean this is the first time he's seen me in decades. 
Who are you talking about? Oh my! Are you jealous, darling? Are you worried that someone is going to steal your beloved wife away? That's actually the last thing I worry about. Oh, darling, that's so romantic. Right. So who did you see today? I'll tell you all about it on the way to the airport, darling. Wait! Airport? That's right, darling. Pack your bags. We're going to America. We can't do that. What about our jobs? Don't worry, darling. I've already called the boss and informed him that we need to take a little trip. He was very understanding. How long will we be gone for? I'm not sure, darling. It all depends on how fast I track him down. What about our daughter? Tomorrow is the first day of high school. If our daughter is anything like her mother, she'll have absolutely no problems whatsoever taking care of herself. Oh, I hope she meets someone special. It would be so nice if she's gotten a boyfriend by the time we get back. I hope not. What was that, darling? N nothing, sweetie. Enough dawdling, darling. We have to get going. Uh, shouldn't I pick up the tapes? They're scattered everywhere. Don't bother, darling. What if our daughter finds them? You know, there's a part of me that hopes she does. <laughs> huh? It's on. Must have hit record. <sighs> out of all the different ways it could have turned out, I never imagined it like this. A few days ago, I received an email with screenshots of certain directories on my personal computer. I don't know how anyone could have managed to accomplish something like that, but I can only assume that this person must have been some kind of top-class computer hacker. They threatened to expose what I've been doing unless I meet their demands. Being discovered and blackmailed has been my worst fear for over a decade now, but this person, whoever they are, isn't asking for money. Instead, they want complete ownership of a single room at Academy High. They intend to occupy this room for a full semester, and they have made it very clear that they are not to be disturbed for any reason. I have no clue what they intend to do in this room, but I'm not really in a position to decline. All things considered, this situation isn't as bad as it could have been. They could have demanded an absurd sum of money, and instead, all they want is a room. Their request seemed harmless enough, and there was a suitable room available, so I decided to comply with their demands. Well, it's not like I really have a choice in the first place. They also asked me to make sure that the room has certain equipment inside of it before they arrived. Computer monitors and hard drives. We already had a surplus of supplies like that, so it wasn't a problem. The tricky part was convincing the rest of the faculty not to enter a specific room for any reason. And not to question it, either. I spent a long time mulling it over and eventually came up with a cover story that seemed convincing enough to believe. To be perfectly honest, I'm a little proud of it. I told the faculty that a special needs student with extreme agoraphobia wishes to attend Academy High... Because of their intense social anxiety, they will remain secluded in one of the school's rooms and are not to be disturbed because it would trigger a panic attack. Teachers will record their lectures when class is in session and email these recordings, along with class assignments, to the reclusive student once per day. I will personally handle anything else the student requires such as meals at lunchtime. Some of the teachers thought my story sounded a little sketchy and wanted to hear details. Their questions were harmless, but I was sweating bullets. 
and I felt like I was being interrogated by the police. Eventually, I convinced them to believe the cover story, and the meeting ended with the faculty praising me for being so accommodating to a mentally handicapped adolescent. <laughs> I felt a little guilty for deceiving them, but it's far from the worst thing I've done. The only thing that matters is the end result. We now have a room which is off-limits to students and faculty alike. The hacker never told me their name, age, even their gender. It's frustrating. If I'm going to be put through such a harrowing experience, I at least want to know who's behind it. I set up a hidden camera outside of the room that has been set aside for the hacker. When I got into work this morning, I checked the recording, only to find that it had been replaced with a graphic of a black silhouette wearing a red wig, along with the words, Don't try this again. The message has been received, loud and clear. I asked the hacker if they needed anything else from me. Daily meals or anything of the sort. They told me not to worry about them, and to simply go about my business as usual. They explicitly told me to pretend they don't exist. It's going to be nearly impossible for me to put them out of my mind when they could end my career with a single click. It feels like there's a slimy creature crawling underneath my clothing, and I simply have to grit my teeth and live with it. Then again, I don't really have any right to complain. Perhaps this is simply karmic retribution for my actions. It's very fortunate that these little therapy sessions were confined to cassette tapes. If I had been making digital recordings instead, the hacker would have a lot of very dangerous information right now. With that said, I no longer feel comfortable keeping these tapes around. They're too much of a liability. I should dispose of them, but it would be such a shame. Thirty years of my innermost thoughts just tossed away like trash. It would feel like I'm wiping someone's memory. What, what was the point of recording anything at all if I was just going to destroy it one day? There was never anyone in my life who I felt comfortable expressing my anxieties to. This tape recorder has been like a... like a close friend who I could trust with my deepest secrets. I know I have to dispose of these tapes, but... Maybe I'll keep them for a few days. Listen to them one last time. Try to figure out where it all went wrong. Then dispose of them when I've said my goodbyes. But... There is one tape that I'm already prepared to part ways with. The tape I made after Mr. Psycho's recent, uh, demands... It's far, far too risky for a recording like that to exist. That one must be destroyed immediately.